this is Mr. Sachs. He's coming in from Boston. Um, he's a uh, an artist. He's an entrepreneur. He has his own uh, website business. He's a photographer. He also does. He helps out in the community, and he's gotten involved with a guy named Al Cooper. And Al Cooper, some of you guys, shamefully, you don't know who Bob Dylan is, but Al Cooper has worked with Bob Dylan and many other acts. He's an icon in rock and roll. And we'll get into that um, later. Uh, but uh, I wanted him to come in and be able to talk to you a little bit about um, how he, um, you know, his background, why he became an artist and why he started his websites. Um, because you really live in the age of the internet. Um, and, you know, you, there's really no reason that you can't, if you want to start a business, you can start a business, not that it's easy. Uh, but um, we'll get into all this uh, as we go along. And again, please come up if you have a question, have it have it ready. And then within the you know the last 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes or so, I'd like you to ask him your questions because that's really what it's all about. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Sachs is here with us, and I'd like to ask Mr. Sachs just can you give us a little bit of background on your on you know on you as an individual, your bio, just you know. Where are you from, where you grew up, and how did you get into the arts and so on? Uh, good questions. Actually, um, I grew up in uh, New York State, not that far from New York City. Uh, oh. My parents moved to a farm when I was about four years old. Uh, but the secret is my father kept his city job. But the farm was cool because uh, there was a barn full of tools and a tractor you could drive. And so building things and making things was just sort of second nature uh, in a way that not a lot of kids have access to oh, today. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I ended up going to MIT, uh, wow. which is the Caltech of the East Coast. But um, I was really miscast there. Uh, I had among the worst entry uh, board scores of uh, in math of any kid that in my in fact I think I had the worst uh, math level two scores of any kid in my entry year and I kind of really wish that I had gone to art school but by that time um, my parents were kind of fond of telling their friends that their kid went to MIT so I stuck it out uh, and I had a very brilliant uh, advisor who was able to switch me into he basically built courses in art and photography and uh, filmmaking at MIT uh, they had a famous photographer Minor White who was a student of Ansel Adams and they had Ricky Leacock who was a very famous documentary filmmaker and uh, so I was very lucky I, I had some really um, uh, given the fact that it wasn't an art school um, I was I was I was really quite lucky. Um, I started out in architecture, and a friend of mine said to me when I was probably sophomore year, he said, uh, "Why are you doing architecture? You're really interested in art." And so I went to my advisor and I said, "I want to switch my major," and we did. And that's when I started working with the filmmakers and photographers, excuse me, at MIT. Um, and then. Uh, I thought I was interested in making films. I got a little job uh, uh, in Boston uh, with a company to make Super 8 films. It's hard to believe in 1960, 1971, people thought Super 8 movies were going to be a big deal, and then video took that over. So I ended up making uh, 35 millimeter slides. That's also hard to realize, but these little two by two slides that your grandparents have, that was the way that corporations used to. Uh, communicate and I eventually built a company of 40 people making these little word slides that corporations use today everybody just uses PowerPoint but there was no PowerPoint and there were no personal computers so we made these little slides and we sold them for a lot of money and um, but one of the things that happened was that eventually computers did come along and uh, there were a series of um, sort of financial crises in which I had to, you know, fire like half the people and then another time another half of the people because computers were taking over. And it never occurred to me that my company would get swamped by technology, right? It's something you think is going to happen to the other guy, but it actually happened to me. Um, and in fact, um, so eventually, uh, 
you know, we transitioned to building websites and I did a, a lot of major websites. And that took many, many, many hours of staying up till midnight trying to figure out how to build websites. I'm talking about like in 1990 or something like that. Uh, and I'm semi-retired now, but I'm still building websites. I have two of them I have to start on tomorrow, basically using WordPress. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of learning that you have to do uh, to, to do a good website. But I will tell you that, you know, there's sites like Squarespace and so forth where you can kind of build your own. Uh, so anyway. Um, could I could I show one of your websites? Do you mind? Sure. Uh, let, any, let, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which one would you prefer? Well, if you want. Uh, I've got john Sachs or the john Sachs collected it's up to you yeah let's look at john Sachs collected since i retired i started doing a lot of things i started making sculptures so what i've done john Sachs collected is um, a way of explaining all the different things that i have my fingers into um so as you scroll down the first one is sculpture i'm making 3d interactive sculptures the second one is my business uh where i make websites and do photography uh, a friend of a friend of mine just asked me to build a website for some folks in Africa that are doing a project teaching women how to do crafts in a little village in Uganda. That's called Gwindi for women. So I just made that. Uh, I started a sculpture park in my hometown of Burlington. That's the next uh, one down. I'm the chair of a political group bringing a, pro a program called the Community Preservation Act to Burlington. A Russian guy named Fetty, uh, we got to know each other online and I made a whole series of wacky videos and we built a website called Third Bird uh, Video Ideas. And that's pure fun. Absolutely no attempt at making money there just for fun. I went to, uh, I had done a lot of photography for MIT of the surprisingly extensive music department. And one day they had a lecture by Al Cooper. Now, when I was a kid, my hero was Bob Dylan. Uh, just to give you a quick reference, uh, at one point the Beatles were carrying around a Bob Dylan album under their uh, arm. It was the freewheeling Bob Dylan. Uh, and Cooper had uh, played organ. It's a very long story we won't get into, but basically, during Bill, Dylan's most productive era, Al Cooper was the guy who shaped his sound more than anybody else. Uh, and then he started a group called Blood, Sweat and Tears that was very big. And then he managed the group called Leonard Skinner that was very big, really interesting guy. And so I went home, he gave us a lecture and he was incredibly humble. And I went home and looked at his website and it hadn't been touched in 10 years, it looked like he had died. And I offered to do it over i thought it would take me a weekend but it actually took me something like 12 weekends solid uh and then eventually um i suggest we do a podcast and now we do a podcast together and um it's been downloaded about forty-five thousand times but he didn't do everybody i mean he knew the beatles he knew the stones he knew Jimi hendrix obviously he knew dylan and a lot of other uh famous people from that particularly from that era uh, the 60s and early 70s. And then if you keep going down, uh, you know, I have a special site just for my photographic work. I have my personal journal that I haven't dealt with in about a year, but it's there. Uh, and then I'm doing this singer songwriter thing. And then I'm very involved in this local park called Mary Cummings Park for whom I do the website. And then I have the country's leading website about poison ivy and poison oak. Wow. I also involved in community theater. What I can't, what else is down there? Oh yeah, I built a website, teaching website about photography. And I also started a web, uh, a company that didn't go anywhere uh, called Video 120 to do biographies of older folks. And two years ago, I did a major project to try to influence the outcome of the 2020 election called John the Purple. And we spent a few thousand dollars uh, buying ads to put my videos in front of people in swing states. So uh, I am um, way scattered all over the place. Some of those projects are active. Some of those projects are not active. Uh, but rather than try to explain to people 
the complexity of what I'm up to, I just say, yeah, go to John Sachs Collected and see what you're interested in. Interesting. Um, now, I will say this. I'm semi-retired and I can do basically anything I want. Uh, and so I'm extremely busy, but it's almost all self-inflicted. It's assignments I've given myself. Uh, so if I was still in business, primarily in business, I wouldn't have a website this complex because it's not good marketing. People don't know how to handle it if you say you do five different things or even three different things or even two different things. If you're marketing yourself, especially early in your career, you're better off to say, this is who I am. I only do this. Uh, even if you're just in photography, you don't want to say, I am an everything photographer. You want to say, I'm a portrait photographer or I'm a wedding photographer because people can understand that. If you say I'm good at everything, they can't, they can't absorb that. They don't, they don't know how to process that. So as a marketing thing, John Sachs Collected is a terrible approach, but I'm retired and I don't care, you know? And a lot of the projects that I'm working on are creative projects. So um, I basically, you know, put up whatever I want. And, it, you know, if you look at somebody like, uh, well, let's say Picasso, when he was young, he just painted. All he did was paint and he got famous for painting. When he was older, he could do whatever he want because he was Picasso. It didn't make any difference. Generally, in my growing up years, it was recognized as the greatest artist of all time. I don't know if that's really true. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, Picasso was really somebody else. So anyway, so that's, that's where I'm at now. Uh, I try to spend at least one day a week building sculptures in my basement. Uh, and, uh, and then writing songs and, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy, but it's fun. Do you, um, um, you said just basically if I'm getting this right, if, if a student wants to start a business, you're saying stay focused on something specific that you're really good at. Is that, would that be I, fair to say? I would say that yes, because, um, people can't absorb the fact that you are a sculptor and a songwriter. They go like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I can't, mm -hmm. that, that that's not right. You're either one or the other. Uh, and so I would say, if you want to start a business, it has to be something that people can get uh, quickly. They can say, yeah, oh, I get that. Now it could be something that everybody understands. Like if you're going to be a, I don't know, a, you know, everybody knows what a doctor is and a lawyer is, or even a house painter. You say, that's what I do. And they go, yeah, I got it. If you're going to do something that never anybody never thought of, well, then you got to do a lot more marketing. Now, let me just say that um, marketing has changed enormously. When I was running my business with 40 employees in Boston, there was a magazine called the Boston Business Journal. And the only marketing I ever had to do was put ads in there that we're having a workshop or we had a new service and every client and every prospect read the Boston Business Journal. There was no social media. Well, today we have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and a bunch of others that I'd probably never even heard of. Uh, but there's no one place that you can ever reach everybody anymore. There simply isn't any one place you can go to. It's much, much more complicated. Um, so you have to uh, you have to play a little dance between you have to be aware. Somebody once said to me something about, you know, you need to find your audience. If you're a creative person, you need to find your audience. But even if you're in business, you need to find your customers. And I will tell you that uh an iffy artist, an iffy photographer, or a not very good house painter, they're all going to succeed if they're good at marketing. Marketing is um, incredibly important. Uh, you see those lawyers with those giant billboards like Better Call Saul, that's marketing, you know? So. Uh, is there a... Um you've been around, you've been a successful businessman. Um, you've, you kind of have your pulse on a lot of different things based on your John Sachs collective website. Young people today, 
if you were to give them a suggestion, what would you suggest they do in terms of a business based on your experience and what you see going on in the world today? Gosh, it's really difficult. Uh, I was never any good at taking advice and <laughs> advice is hard to, it's hard. Advice is hard to accept because uh, you kind of have to know somebody. You know what I'm going to say to you? Um, there is no simple one answer to what success is. If you look at the animal world, uh, elephants succeed because they're really big and nobody can mess with them. And rabbits succeed because uh, they reproduce really fast. And, you know, and, and, and spiders succeed because they do their thing. And everybody has a different solution, right? So, and... In in terms of careers, you see people that say, I'm going to go work for a big corporation. Because if I work for a big corporation, I'm going to get a paycheck and I'm going to get retirement and they're going to tell me what to do. And for some people, that might be the right thing to do. And then other people say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to invent my own life. Now, inventing your own life is like designing a new animal, right? It's tough, but you can do it. Um, one of the things I pointed out Years ago, when I was about your kid's age, the Beatles were the biggest thing that ever happened in music. And they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. And it was like, in those days, there were no cable. There were three channels and that was it. And everybody watched. I would say probably more than half of every American watched that Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. Now, they had three cameras on that stage to uh, video the Beatles. Each camera was probably worth half a million dollars. I mean, those cameras were half the size of a car. Now, you have an iPhone or a smartphone like this. All three cameras, ignoring the one in the front, but all three cameras in this smartphone are like, all three cameras in this smartphone are like a thousand times better than the three cameras they had on stage with the Beatles in 1965 or four, whenever that was. So you can count around a level of technology that is unbelievable. Plus, which you all know that you can start a YouTube or a TikTok channel, and maybe you can gather enough followers to turn it into a business. Maybe. Now, we all know that every person in America can't live by running a TikTok channel. Somebody's got to grow the food, fix the plumbing, right? Teach the kids, drive the buses and so forth, right? Um, and so for everybody, it's kind of a personal decision. Uh, when I look back, I often say this, I mean, my life right now is fine. I'm really busy, I'm having a good time, but I often look back and say, there is not one decision I would make in my life that I would make the same way. I wouldn't have gone to the same college, probably wouldn't have stayed in, around Boston my whole life. Almost every decision I made, if I really had it to do over, I'd make it differently. But you don't get to make those choices twice. So do I regret that I spent, you know, all those years uh, doing not very creative work? Yes and no, not really. It's what I did. Had to make a living. I had to put food on the table, right? But you, you guys have through YouTube and TikTok and all the rest, you have the possibility of doing something uh, that in my generation was impossible, was absolutely impossible, right? These things did not exist. So, so you're carrying around a, a complete television studio right here, aside from what you can do on your laptop or your tablet. Um, wow, that's really... I love how you look at it. You guys have this technology at your fingertips. Before we go any further, are there anybody out there, anybody out there that has any questions right now you want to throw at Mr. Sachs? Go ahead and throw it into the chat or you could speak up. It's up to you. Um, I wanted to ask as we wait for some of these questions, I hope you guys just type it in or just uh, let, let us know. You became an entrepreneur. That's a scary thing. Yeah, I think to start a business, how did you overcome that fear? I mean, uh, I'll tell you that exactly what happened is I took this job, this little company making Super 8 films and slides, and uh, we're very busy. 
and I hired an assistant. And this assistant came to me one day and said, you know what? You know everything about this business. You should start your own company and I'll come work for you. So what she did is she injected into me believing in me. And because she believed in me, uh, I believed in myself. And then uh, I just jumped in and did it. And certainly there were moments I didn't, I was, you know, worried and scared. And she and I are still friends, by the way, uh, 50 years later. So um, um, that's kind of, but I'll say one other thing. And that is my father ran a magazine, a small magazine for the coffee and tea business. Hmm. And seeing him run his own business made it, clear to me that I could run a business because I watched him do it and say, well, you know, it, it became a natural thing. But let me just say one other thing. Uh, you've got to know what you really want and what your skills are and what you're good at. Because the truth of the matter is, my father was never really happy running that business. Uh, he was fighting and wrestling with his employees who were always coming up and giving him you know, BS stories about this, that, or the other thing. And it pretty much, drove, he really just wanted to be a writer. But as a magazine publisher and editor, you, you got to sell advertising space. You got to go to conventions. You got to deal with people. So it wasn't for about 20 years that I realized after I started my business, that I didn't really particularly want to be in business either. There were too many parts of it I didn't like. There were too many people coming up to me and saying, oh, Mr. Sachs, I can't come in so tomorrow because my aunt died or my grandmother died. And I thought, that's weird. She's the first person I knew that had five grandmothers who died. You know, <laughs> um, I had people coming up to me and saying, uh, oh, you got to do something about this guy in the art department. He smells really bad. He hasn't taken a shower. So I got to sit down with a grown man and say, hey, dude, you got to go. You got to shower. And I didn't you know, that wasn't me. There are people who are managers by nature that they're really good at getting work out of other people. They know how to motivate people and get people excited and interested. I could do it a little bit, but basically I'd like to do things rather than manage other people. So after 25 years, I said, ah, the heck with it. Uh, and I became a freelancer and I actually was a lot more productive because I didn't spend all day fighting with the employees. You know? uh, so you've got you to get a feeling for what works for you. Are you a natural leader, a natural organizer? In that case, well, you know, starting a business, that could happen. But I do think that, um, I, I just heard somebody say, uh, Oh, long story, but basically um, he apprenticed himself to like the best barbecue guy in Houston. And he worked for him for free for a month because he wanted to learn barbecue. Next thing he's running a, a very successful barbecue shop in China. But he what he did is he apprenticed himself to somebody who was good. And that's a really good way to find out if you really like something and can get trained is, you know, try something. And if you, after, after a while, you realize you hate it, you know, move on. Okay, we got a bunch of questions here. Uh, I'm going to go through them. One of the questions from uh, Jayla is, will you ever return to your inactive websites? Very good question. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm going to return to the, uh, I, in John's journal, I had a thing called Moments of Joy. And like I was trying every day to say, wow, look at this wonderful little thing that happened. It only takes like 30 seconds to write one down. But let me explain the other thing about moments of joy in the journals. This is what bothered me. Uh, people my age, we get on, we understand Facebook. We don't much understand some of the other social medias. But here's the problem with Facebook. Two things. One is you put something on it like 10 o'clock in the morning, and then it just drifts down 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 no, no nobody ever sees it it's gone and i thought well you know there's some things i don't care about but there are other things i do care about so i said what i'm going to do is i'm going to make this john's journal and anything i create i'll create it on john's journal and then i'll just paste that page into facebook okay so that my stuff like you know if there's stuff that you really care about you don't want to see it just float down the stream into the garbage in Facebook. So I said, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to actually uh, make it permanent. But I have not been back there in a while. I'm definitely going to go back to that. Um, um, yeah, uh, this campaign to pass this Community Preservation Act is eating up an incredible amount of time. And that ends November 8th. And I'm really excited about that ending so I can get back to my real life. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Jeff Cardona asks, what is your favorite sculpture that you have ever made? Oh, boy. It's probably the one I'm working on now, but it's so unmade. Um, <laughs> the, the, the one I'm working on is so hard, I can't, I can't even, you know. Uh, I had this idea. Uh, go to the... Um, if you go back, uh, it's the spheres. It's this simple freaking idea, and people, particularly kids, love it. Go to the sculpture one and click on check out my sculptures, and then uh, you guys can watch this video. It's not a very good video, but um, uh, scroll down the page a little bit. Oh, you, you could play the video. All right. Uh, I'll play it. Hi, right I'm John Sachs. I like sculpture of all kinds, but I have set out to create sculpture that you can walk up to and change in some way. And that every time you go see it, it can look a little bit different. It's an interesting oh. challenge to make yeah. interactive sculpture that can sit out. Yes. You so that's probably my favorite one because it's most successful there's one that you saw at the beginning with those cans and the thing is the ones with the cans is cool but it just looks like a bunch of paint cans it looks kind of stupid uh, whereas the one that I call rolling spheres uh, that's really nice every time i go by people have changed it and that's why let me put it this way i think i write pretty good songs for an old guy right but the truth is, within 50 miles of me, there's 10,000 old guys that all want to be <laughs> singer songwriters, and nobody wants to hear our songs. But interactive sculpture, I have scoured the web, and nobody's doing what I'm doing. So it's probably the single thing that I'm most excited about. And the best one is the Rolling Sphere so far. Wow. Okay, so the next question from Carla Romero. She says, I'm curious to know, what do you prefer more, writing songs or sculpting? That's about a 50-50. I keep saying to myself, I'm going to stop writing songs because everybody's writing songs and nobody wants to hear your suits, your stupid songs. Uh, but, and I'll get back to work on the sculpture and then I'll get a new idea for song and I can't resist it. So it's really, <laughs> those those are the two main things where, where, the, where the creative energies are going. Is Oh, and the other thing is, if you go to my Uncle John Song's website, I make original videos these days for most of my songs. And like I said, this is like this, you know, this iPhone, you know, is like a $5 million worth of video equipment from the old days. So if you go to uncle John songs, uh, all of the recent songs uh, I have made videos and, you know, it's just, yeah, you can go take a look at that. Uh, I'm going to play it just for a couple of seconds, if you don't mind. Well, my mama, she's too busy with every nickel and dime to answer all my questions. She hasn't got the time. But mama, do you remember the white puppy that we once had Was that when you were married And I still had a dad yeah, that's oh, probably mama, do you... Yes, sir. I was at the airport dropping off my girlfriend. I heard a little boy say to his mother, Mama, do you remember the white puppy that we once had? And I thought, what kind of a statement is that? What is the story behind that? And they were gone. I never found out how could you have had a white puppy that didn't grow up to be a white dog? So I, I had to write the song and then I made the video and all those are, this is all done in Final Cut on a Mac and all of those effects are kind of built in effects that I just sort of, usually what I do is I make shapes in Photoshop and then I bring them into Final Cut and I animate them and add effects and try to do something. So it starts, my songs usually start with words 
and then I'll find a melody. I really wish I could sing like, you know, whatever, but I, I do what I can. And then I have a lot of fun with the videos. So I would say I'm really stuck between the sculpture and the songs. Um, okay. So Kim, Miss Jones asks, so you're good at so many things. What would you say that you're best at? Boy, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, well, <laughs> I, I actually think some of my songs are really, really good. And I'm able to knock out a song that I think is good really fast. But a lot of other people think that about their stuff, too. I think I'm a very good photographer, uh, basically because I understand about light. If you want to be a good photographer, uh, there's a lot, a lot of things to understand. I built a whole website. It, it's on that. It's on it's John Sachs Collected. It's called Photo Matters. And I tried to document every every variable, creative variable in photography. But really, an awful lot of it comes down to understanding light. Well, let me say this. I don't believe anybody understands light, neither do I. But at least I can sort of spot uh, good light. You see that right there on the left? There's this woman photographed with a wide angle lens and the same woman photographed with a telephoto lens. And so I'm demonstrating the difference between different focal lengths of uh, there. Um, I know a lot about photography, but then again, there's an awful lot of photographers. And now with the, with the smartphones, everybody considers themselves a photographer. So uh, being a photographer is... I'll tell you the thing I love about photography. Somebody says, would you come and photograph this meeting or whatever? I go and I photograph and I send the pictures and we're done. That's it. I get the money, they get the pictures. If you do a video, if you do a video, you shoot for like four, six, eight, ten 10 hours, and then you edit for like 40 hours. And then they start complaining and they want it this way and they want it that way and they want it and you're never, ever done. That kind of drives me crazy. I like the crispness of photography. Uh, websites are a little bit more like videos in that it's really hard to uh, ever actually. Well, the thing about a website is it's never, ever done. Where a photo shoot, you go to the event, you take the pictures, here's the pictures, done deal, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm a good photographer. Adriana Yurub asks, who is your inspiration? You know, I just gave a concert uh, recently, and I said, in terms of songwriting, a lot of people said Dylan was such a great, like when I was a kid, yeah, guys, I don't understand that Dylan was it for people like me. I mean, there was other folk singers and other rock groups, but Dylan was the man. Uh, a lot of people said that they wanted to write songs because Dylan wrote great songs. And my attitude was, I don't ever want to write a song because he's so freaking good that my songs are going to sound stupid in comparison. Uh, and so I didn't write a song for literally half a century uh, after it took me that long to get over Dylan. So songwriting. Yeah, obviously he's a hero. Um, there's a lot of heroes in photography. Um, and then in terms of public life, you know, I wish there were more public figures that you could be more, you could hold up as heroes. Uh, uh, there used to be more. Like when I was a kid, we had a Republican president called Dwight David Eisenhower, who was a general in World War II. And uh, he was a very, very honorable guy. And I would have to say that a lot of presidents since then, on either party, have really not held up as well. He lived about two hours from here when he yeah. retired, uh, Palm Springs. Anyways, okay. Jairo Ariano asks, what is the most important thing to remember when starting a business? Wow. Wow. Hmm. Well, I guess the first thing is that you have to remember that it is a business. It revolves around money. Because if you're a painter, that's not a business. That's a passion, right? And you don't care if you make money, but if it's a business, it's a business and you got to make money and you got to pay the bills. Now, the thing is, 
I was looking back on some videos that my company made back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And I realized that I shortchanged myself by being too worried about paying the bills and not being open enough to making my company more creative. There were people working for me who were saying to me, John, instead of just making these stupid word slides for these company presentations, why don't we get more creative? But I was scared because I had to pay the bills and I had to make the decision, well, you know, do we take a chance and try to go into a much more creative, a, make it a much more creative company, which could fail? Or do we just keep making the stupid word slides that makes money? Those are those are sort of unanswerable questions, you know, that come up. But a business is a business. And uh, let me tell you one interesting thing about running a business. Something I realize is that your employees are not your friends, fundamentally, because you can fire them, right? And you can't ever be honest with them to the extent that you can't, you can't say, I don't even know if I feel like doing this anymore. You can't tell your employees that. You may think that, but you can't say it. And your customers are not your friends either because you can't say to them, you know, I've really had it up to here with this. It's driving me crazy. Uh, you can't say that. So you're always putting on a front to your customers and to some extent as your to your employees as well. Your real peer group is other people who own small businesses. So what I did is I started a round table that meant met once every month with a whole bunch of people like eight people that all owned a small business in a non-competing area because so they would say like yeah i hear you i get it i go through the same thing i have employees who lie to me about their grandmother's funeral you know or whatever the case may be so your peer group is is similar people in a non-competitive business if you can find them that can really be a useful thing because they don't have any axe to grind Right. You know, like you could have a board of directors, but they're all, you know, they're all in it maybe for their own reason, because they want you to hire their cousin or they want you to hire their brother in law who's a lawyer. You know what I mean? But if you have other business owners, it's like they'll tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, De Devin asks, how long did it take to get to where you're at today? I mean, I, it's kind of a broad question i guess but. well um let me put it this way <laughs> in my lifetime in my parents lifetime the greatest politician the greatest president we ever had was named franklin delano roosevelt because he instituted something called social security and social security says if you screw up and you don't save anything you're not going to be poor when you're getting gold we're going to make sure you have enough money to live on i'm living on social security right I worked my arse off for 50 years to get here, and I do have some personal savings. But right now, it's it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt Social Security that's paying my bills and allowing me to spend my days writing songs, building sculptures, uh, you know, running community organizations, and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess to get to this plateau where I can basically not worry too much about money and be creative. It took, you know, 50 years of work. Mike Guerrero has a great question here. He says, I have a business. Now, this is a 17-year-old kid, I think. I have yeah. a business, but I want to know how to make it blow up. I am dedicated to making scarves, et cetera. I have been selling for over a year, but for some reason, I can't gather a large amount of followers, and my monthly income is larger than my expenses. I don't know if he meant the reverse, but anyways. Yeah, well, no. Uh, you, I assume you watch Shark Tank on TV. I do. You, I don't know if Mike does, if he's out well, there. If you're interested yeah. in business, you really got to watch that because those are guys, those are sharks. They're only interested, their religion is money, right? They don't, they don't care. I mean, they care about your passion, but only insofar as it's going to make money for them. And they say, yeah, it may be a good idea, but not going to make enough money. Uh, I, before I fully retired i have a niece she has a company called papercraft miracles she's about 30 something headed toward 40 she makes homemade paper so it's a real good example of like making your own business all right 
So she was teaching me, I'm twice her age, right? She's teaching me about social media. That's how she, she gets, she sells paper, handmade paper, wedding albums and flowers and seed bumps all over the planet. And I said, how did you, how did you get it? Well, she spends all day, all night on social media. So for her, uh, Instagram is like, you know, Instagram is a game. You can't just instantly have 10,000 followers. So what you got to do is, you know, she'll sit there watching TV with her family and she'll add, she'll, she'll follow more and more and more and more people in the hopes that they will follow her. And she puts out constant things about, I did this with hashtags. So remember I said before, it's all about the marketing. She makes wonderful things, but she probably puts most of her effort into the social media. That's really, she does some, she's in Buffalo, New York. She probably does a few street fairs now and then, but it's all about the social media. Um, I should also point out that I take, you know, songwriting lessons from a professional musician named Vance Gilbert. Uh, and uh, he's toured nationally. Well, Vance's life as a professional folk singer is being on stage maybe three, four hours a week. He might have a concert Friday, Saturday, maybe one other day a week. So what does he do all day? other than driving from, you know, Pittsburgh to Philly or whatever for the next gig, it's all social media. That's what he does all day. He Facebooks and does all the rest of that stuff to stay in touch with his fans. It's okay, tough. I, I, yeah, I've got, we got a couple more minutes left and we got one, another good question here. Annalise Angulo, Angulo, excuse me. She says, I have a business, a cosmetics line, what advice would you give me to make it successful? And I think you kind of touched on it already with the social media, but. Well, I, I would say this, you know, clearly, um, you know, what I think, I think what you got to do, for one thing, you got to really focus in on who your clients are. Is it people your age? Is it in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever it is? And put your brain into their brain. Uh, being empathetic putting yourself in their position as a customer is really, really, really important. And then I would say, um, like, make it really, make the story really to, easy to understand. Like at one point, people figured out that cosmetics were like, had bad chemicals. So somebody said, no, I got cosmetics that are good for you, good for your skin. Well, that was like a big selling thing, right? Well, now everybody does that. So you've got to have a story that people can instantly, oh, I heard about this line of cosmetics that can whatever, you know, it's made from dandelions or it, whatever, whatever, whatever. You got to wrap it up in a story that they can get really fast and then push that out on social media. Okay. Wow. That's powerful. You know, uh, we've run out of time. I really appreciate Mr. Sachs. I, man, I'm, this is great. <laughs> so, um, Anyways, uh, I appreciate everyone being here. I thank you, Mr. Sachs, for being here. I appreciate sure. it. You are, I'd love to have you back if you don't mind. Anytime. Uh, now, I, you kids, you kids have toys that we could not dream of. And it, yeah. to me, it would be, it's a little, it's a little scary to have something that powerful, but you got it. Make it, yeah. Seize the day. Thank Seize you very much, Mr. Sachs. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Okay. Have a good day. It's never boring, really. There's always something fun here at Shadow Ridge School. Hi, it's in Shadow Ridge School. The best Indian in the Hi, my name is Aaliyah Fowler, and I'm from Shadow Ridge, the best Indian school out here in Hesperia. You know what it is. Before.